We are in the Gospel of Luke, and we are in chapter 13, and we're going to begin in verse 18. If you will follow along with me, Luke 13, 18 begins this way. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It was like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Again, he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The poet William Shakespeare wrote a number of love sonnets. One of the most famous is sonnet number 18. I won't say the whole thing, it would be embarrassing, but let me give you at least the first quatrain here. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. You hear how he begins this sonnet? He begins it with a question, and there's, it's a very powerful rhetorical technique to begin with a question. Isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, that was kind of a cheap way to make it a question. So why is that so, so powerful? Well, at least in the case of Shakespeare, let's start with that. When he says, how do I compare my love for this woman? And, and what he wants us to feel is he's struggling for that. See, that's a universal human emotion, and he makes that connection with us that we sometimes have a difficult time putting our feelings into words. And you get the idea that he's right along with you when he says, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And then he goes on to say, actually, no, you're much better than a summer's day. You know, a summer's day might blow hard winds, and it's t too short. So I think you're actually better than that, right? That's nice. Jesus is using the same technique here. And just to be clear, Jesus did it first by at least 1,600 years, okay? It shouldn't surprise us that Jesus, who is the ultimate truth, right, would also be the ultimate poet. See, Jesus loves truth and goodness and beauty, and we find him to be the ultimate exemplar of all. So it, it shouldn't surprise us that he phrases his words in a way that are beautiful. And that's what he, he begins. It's really interesting that he begins this parable, at least it is to me. He says, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? See, and we know that he's not struggling for words. This is the incarnate word. This is the inventor of all words and all ideas. So he's at no loss for them at any given time. So he must be asking that question as a rhetorical device. It must be for our benefit, that he wants us to think for a minute. And I think this is where we need to begin with here. He wants us to, to realize, hey, you know, this must be difficult. I know it's difficult for you to visualize. I want to try and help you visualize what the kingdom of God is like. And that's the title for today's sermon. What is the kingdom of God like? And that is a normal-sized human hand holding a mustard seed. I thought about, it would be unfair if I had Ralph do it, right? So we got, we got a mustard seed. And you've all heard the story of the mustard seed. We have since we were kids in Sunday school. Because a lot of us have been going to church a long time. And this, we've heard this parable before, the little mustard seed. And it, it, it grows into a large plant, maybe even a tree. And I just want us to slow down here, and I want us to think deeply about a couple of things. One is, the fact that Jesus asked this in a form of a question is not just beautiful art. It is that, but there's something to this. I think he wants us to think deeply about what the kingdom of God will be like. And then there's a second question, which maybe we don't think of too often, is why is this here in the Gospel of Luke where it is? And I think if we can grasp onto those two questions, then it might help us understand more deeply what is trying to be communicated in this parable, why it made sense to his disciples then, and what hope it offers for us. Now, to do that, we have to kind of go back just a little bit. I won't go back too far, because I know we've kind of covered this last verse a lot, but the, the question about what 
verse 18, which is where this starts, why is it here, maybe begins in verse 17. So at the time, Jesus has just healed a woman who had some form of demonic oppression that had her bent over almost in half. And he released her from that, and he, but he did it on the Sabbath, which was against the rules by those that make the rules. And so there was a division among the large crowd. It was, hey, you shouldn't be healing on the Sabbath. And Jesus is like, are you out of your mind? You, you've become so rule-oriented, you've outlawed doing good. Now you just tell me what the purpose of that is. So he rebuked him, and that's why verse 17 says, when he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted. And all the one, they were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare to? Do you notice there's a word then? And that just wasn't inserted by somebody in the 1600s. That's If you are able to trace this back, there's, a, there's actually a Greek word there for that. And that Greek word is sometimes translated then or thus or therefore. I, I tell you this because this is an intentional placement of this parable here. And it's interesting to me why. See, this is a parable that I think Jesus told a lot. I think sometimes people get confused because this parable is also in Matthew and it's also in Mark. And Jesus told, I think, some of the same parables over and over again. If you were going around the country speaking to an audience and it was a different audience today or tomorrow, you might say some of the same things. You guys have heard me say some of the same things. Some of you are tired. You're, uh, told me that you know, I'm tired of hearing about the chicken and the chicken house and the Christian and whatever. And I, 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 so I get it, but I think Jesus was a good teacher, and I think good teachers do that. So he's probably told this parable before at different parts of his ministry. Why here in Luke? Well, let's see, where are we? We've just seen a healing. We've just seen a large group of people be delighted with that, but we've also seen a large group be divided over that. I think Jesus was always talking about the coming kingdom of God, so let's put ourselves in the mind of his disciples they're on their way to Jerusalem. They must be thinking, hey, this is what this is going to be like. He warned us there might be division. So we're going to get to Jerusalem, and this takeover that we're part of in this kingdom is going to be kind of a split, and some are going to be for, and some are going to be opposed. We heard him say that. I got that part of it. But here it comes. This is where the kingdom comes in. And I think Jesus needs to point out, you know, like in, in, in Dingo Montoya, in The Princess Bride, that word kingdom, I don't think it means what you think it means. I don't think it's going to happen the way you think it's going to happen. And that's, I think, the purpose of this parable. I think the main purpose of this, why is he asking them to think? Let's think about what would be a good analogy for this. And let me ask you to do the same thing. If I told you that through the actions of this church, this country would experience a great revival what would that mean to you? How would you define revival? How would you define a revolution? Right? No offense here, I'm not going to bring this up in depth, but we saw a whole lot of people talking about what, the, what a wave meant in politics. Was it a wave? Was it a splash? A lot of people were disappointed because they defined victory one way and they didn't achieve it. And honestly, I think both sides ended up a little disappointed, but let's just kind of leave that there. Uh, we ask young people when they're seniors in high school, officially, we ask them, what does success look like for you over the next 50 years? That's a great question, isn't it? So this is what Jesus is asking. Hey, well, I've been telling you about the kingdom of heaven. Let me ask you for a minute. What do you think the kingdom of heaven looks like? Because their minds, it was probably splendor and palaces and robes. And it was probably armor and chariots and horses and it was power. And as much as they had been living with the pacifist Jesus for two and a half years, they could not get over their own ideas of what that meant. <laughs> you you take, just take James and John, the brothers, the sons of thunder, as Jesus referred to them. They meant the kingdom of God was destroying your enemies. Sometimes we mean that too, don't we? It means crushing those who reject or oppose us. 
<laughs> there's a story. You, you doubt me on this. There's a story in Luke chapter 9. I have to bring it up because it was years ago now that we covered it. And it was, it was in Luke 9, 54. Luke 9, 54. They wanted to pass through a Samaritan village. He sent some people on ahead and they said, no, we'd rather not. James and John say this. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? I'm sorry, I'm going, they, they weren't from Alabama necessarily, I don't think. <laughs> fire, it's a three-syllable word in there. <laughs> yeah, Oklahoma, that's true. There, it's just two syllables, right? You want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them, right? What? Is that what you think we're going to do with our enemies when we enter the kingdom? Jesus rebuked them, right? I, mean, I guess my point is they, they have the wrong idea of what the coming kingdom is going to mean. They certainly have the wrong idea of when it's going to happen. They have really no concept yet about what's going to happen when they get to Jerusalem and how that's going to be turned into victory, right? So right here in Luke, right here in Luke, Jesus is going to try and teach them through a parable of a mustard seed what this kingdom's really going to look like, Right? So he says in verse 18, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? What, how can I get you to think of this in the right way? Verse 19, he says, it's like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. And there's a couple of really interesting elements in there, if we'll take the time to see that. By the way, in this teaching, similar teaching in Matthew, we learn a little bit more about the mustard seed. In Matthew 13, 32, he adds this, though it is the smallest of all your seeds, uh, when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. So Matthew tells us this is the largest and it's the smallest, and sometimes people get hung up on that. I think we saw it in our title slide. There's a picture of a mustard seed here. That's tiny, that gets stuck in your teeth, right? Uh, if you're just chewing on mustard seeds, you know, I don't know anybody that does that. Usually we ground them up, they're, they're potent, right? But a few people get hung up on this idea that Matthew says it was the largest and the smallest. Among the colloquial plants, the kinds of typical plants that they would plant, this was indeed the smallest, and it grew to be a pretty large plant. Uh, depending upon the variety, and if there are horticulturists here, you'll know, but depending upon the variety, it was either a large, tall, sunflower seed-looking kind of a plant, or it grew to be this massive bush. I think I've got a picture of it later. But the point right now is that it's going, fellas, listen to Jesus telling these 12 disciples, fellas, it's going to start small. And that's, that's tiny. This is not going to be a great rush, as you imagine it. This is going to start small. I mean, you saw that picture. I'm talking small. But there's another idea. You see, seeds have to be planted in the ground. And we don't think of it as death. But it is. It's the end of one life cycle and the beginning of another. John 12, 24 says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Boy, that's powerful, isn't it? This example of the mustard seed is more than just this is going to begin tiny. It's going to begin with an apparent death. And encompassed in that is also a resurrection. And all that's going to happen. That seed is going to be planted in the ground. And, and you know, this, this principle, this is true in our own lives. With Jesus, it was absolutely true with him as the one mustard seed. With us, we have to die to ourselves. We really have to give up the wheel and let God take over. We have to die to ourselves. And the Bible says as much. We have to, in some cases, hate our own life to, to the point where we would give it up and relinquish it. And what, by hating our own life, it means hate the sin that we're capable of producing. And we say, you know what, I, you drive. I don't want God to be the co-pilot. I, I want you to drive. 
I'm, I'm relinquishing control of my life. I've made a mess of it. I want you to be born again in me. And I know that that happens. That's what happened with the Virgin Mary. I want that same miracle to happen in me. I want the Holy Spirit to overshadow my life. I want God, through Jesus Christ, to be born again in me. I want him to drive. That's the first step to eternity, right there. And what you have to do is die to yourself. You have to go into the ground. And when you do that, a power then can be channeled through you that is infinite and incredibly influential. And this is what Jesus is saying in this little illustration of a mustard seed. Isn't that beautiful? I've heard a sermon about 20 years ago. It was great. It was how the world was changed by 12 ordinary young men, right? And that's true. And there's nothing about that sermon I would disagree with. And the person who gave it is a hero of mine in the faith. But honestly, (laughs) the most significant event and revolutionary event in human history was the death and resurrection of one mustard seed, one man, Jesus. That's it. Everything in the world, it is the axial moment of human history. That's powerful. That's one little mustard seed going into the ground. And I think the the final point about this mustard seed is that it's tiny when it starts. It involves death and resurrection in a way that we sometimes don't think about. You know, we don't have burial ceremonies for seeds when we plant them. We don't, but we could, because the life of the former plant is dying. The former plant produced the seed, and it is dying. And what's beginning is a new plant. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has died, and the new remains. And this is what we see. It's a beautiful illustration with just a little mustard seed, isn't it? But then there's another point about it, and that it gets to be big. This is a picture here of what I'll call a mustard tree, I guess, if you'd like to see a mustard tree. That's a big plant. It looks like almost an overgrown bushy kind of a thing, doesn't it? So to call that a tree is, I suppose you could, it's tall enough. It certainly meets the qualifications that birds could nest in there. I don't see how you'd keep them out of there, right? And it would provide shade and shelter for lots of other rodentia. (laughs) I'll just leave it at that. We're the only country in the world on February 2nd lets the rodent predict the weather. (laughs) Okay, where was I? (laughs) An insight into the way I think about things like that. Um, okay, so this is what this plant looks like. Could you, uh, Julie, maybe you could leave that up there for just a minute. And one of the things that we t- spoke about is that this message of Jesus talking about the mustard seed growing into the tree, it might have actually resonated with his disciples. See, this was not an uncommon image in the Bible. Uh, the fig tree was often used to describe Israel, but the Bible in the Old Testament especially used other kinds of trees growing huge and providing shade. And this image that uh, Matthew suggested, and so did Luke, uh, let me make sure I get it correctly, so that the birds of the air come perch in its branches, that was an image of what a successful human earthly kingdom would look like, right? Now, since we're not a fig tree, we're starting with a mustard seed and doing that, that probably had a little bit of a twist on it. It was more than a twist. It probably produced a little bit of a shock value Wait a minute, I thought we were a fig tree. We're a mustard seed? That's not what we want. We want to be this beautiful fig tree. We're going to be like that? It probably had enough of a shock value to kind of get them out of their contemporary thinking about what a kingdom would look like. And I think that's part of why Jesus illustrated it. Let me take you to some Old Testament verses, just because I love some of these. Ezekiel, verses 17, uh, chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. This is a the Lord talking. He says, uh, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar. I will break off a tender sprig from the topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. I want you to hear that. 
This is talking about a successful kingdom. This is, uh, will be like a big tree that produces fruit and allows birds to nest there. I mean, this is not an accident. It happens again. Later on, Ezekiel 31, he's talking about Egypt this time, beginning in verse 2. Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his hordes, who can be compared with you in majesty? Consider Assyria, once a cedar in Lebanon, with beautiful branches overshadowing the forest. It towered on high, to uh, its top above the thick foliage. The waters nourished it, deep springs made it grow tall. Their streams flowed all around its base and sent channels uh, to all the trees of the field. So it towered higher than all the trees of the field. Its boughs uh, increased and its branches grew long, spreading because of abundant waters. Verse 6 is where it's at here. All the birds of the air nested in its boughs. All the beasts of the field gave birth under its branches. And all the great nations lived in its shade. Do you hear this symbolism? A great tree is an empire on earth that provides for a lot of people. One more, because I like this, and it's in Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And this is early, before he starts having dreams about the future. Nebuchadnezzar needed to be humbled. You might remember that the Lord made him walk around like an animal for a few years, right, to humble him. But before that, he said, I want to tell you something. I want to give Nebuchadnezzar an image of what his empire will be like. And he gave him a dream about a tree. And Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream, beginning in verse 20. He says, The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing fruit for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air. You, O king, are that tree. You've become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky. Your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. And what I'm not telling you is right after that, he says, and the Lord said, cut it down. Because human kingdoms, like trees, they're cut down. But successful ones in the eyes of the Lord are measured, <laughs> isn't this interesting, by how many other nations and races of people take shelter and are protected by them. You know, to, to bear your young in the shelter of a branch means that you're providing that. That's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> The size and stature of a kingdom in the Lord's eyes is measured by how much it does for others. Hmm. Right? Providing fruit, providing shade, providing shelter for birds and beasts, which really means all races of people. See, it was more than just Babylon that benefited from Babylon. It was more than just Rome that benefited from Rome. If you're a student of history, you know of this idea called the Pax Romana. It's Latin for the peace of Rome. The idea that when Rome was for three or 400 years so powerful, and I'm, I'm, it was despotic and it was brutal, and I'm not condoning that, but we are saying that it provided a safe place for commerce and the spread of the gospel. And so there are some benefits to having that. Whatever you think of the United States of America, I say with pride that in the 1900s, three times this nation saved the entire world from totalitarian dictatorships. Once without firing a shot in the Cold War. But three times we were at the lead in doing that. So there were a lot of people who rest in the shade of that. God bless the USA. And thank God for using us but like any tree, he's just waiting. The axe is at the root. And when we cease to do that, cut it down. Jesus is more important than America. Sorry. I'm a Christian, and I love America. But in the eyes of God, these kingdoms, they work like this. So the reason I tell you this now is not to lecture on any part of this. It's to make sure we understand that the measure of these kingdoms that what Jesus is talking about is how many birds can rest in the, in the tree. And that's why when, when Matthew says, this little mustard seed will grow into a mustard tree and the birds of the air will rest in it, it means this will influence and provide for the whole world. This kingdom will, boys, hear Jesus talking to his disciples, be every bit as big as you think it will. But it's going to start small and it's going to grow in ways you don't like starting with the death and the resurrection of its leader. So when we look at human kingdoms, we are really blind. My grandfather used to say this, and I've heard it's attributed to Dr. Robert Schuller. 
I'm not really cool with Dr. Schuler's theology, but I, uh, he said some powerful things, and this is one of them. So any fool can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in one seed. So when that mustard seed goes into the ground, who knows how big it will be? Who knows the kind of influence it will have? Isn't that interesting? Maybe the kingdom of heaven won't look like what we think it will look like. He goes on. Again, he said in verse 20, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? And, and again, the same rhetorical device, the question, introducing another parable, introducing these disciples to the idea, I, I'm struggling to get you to understand what this is really going to be like because I know you have your own preconceived notions and they're not the only ones. We do too, don't we? And he says in verse 21, it's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. And I love this part of it. I, I tell you, sorry, a little science nerd diversion here. When it says large amount of flour, let's talk about a large amount of flour here for just a minute. Because some of you notice, I, I, I preach from an older version of the NIV. It was uh, published, copywritten in 1984. I do that honestly for my own convenience because I've memorized so much scripture. When I want to recall a verse, I'm recalling it in that version. And I'm, I'm, I may have to adapt one of these days because there are new versions that come out all the time. Sometimes they're correcting things. There's better discussions of the language. So this translation that I use just is a large amount of dough. Most other translations say three measures of dough. If you have a uh, a King James or a New American Standard, it, it will tell you that there were three measures. Well, how much is a measure? You know, you and I, we go to buy flour at uh, wherever Mart, and there are five-pound bags, and there's ten-pound bags, right? The measure that we're talking about here, we have pretty good authority to assume it was close to 20 pounds. So... <laughs> The three measures of flour. This is 60 pounds of flour. As a matter of fact, if you have a Bible app, the new version of the NIV, translate it this way. I've actually got it here. It says, it's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour. This woman is the original Mrs. Baird, right? <laughs> That's a big batch of dough, right? Th this is huge. 60 pounds of flour? Do you, what, what event in your family, would you begin with 60 pounds of flour? I mean, I can eat a lot of donuts, but 60 pounds of flour, right? This is what I'm trying to talk about. This, it, don't miss this, because you may not have realized this before, but this is talking about the power of the influence. That's a large bag. It would be silly for an individual family to do that. By the way, a gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So when you add enough water to make this into bread, you're talking about a hundred pound batch of dough, potentially. That's a village. And, and by the way, I, don't, I think that's exactly what was going on here. It was not uncommon for traditions of people in those villages to make food together. It still happens today. Uh, you know, if you know people of Mexican descent, they make tamales and they make hundreds, sometimes thousands at a time, right? It's, and it's fantastic. It's a party when they make tamales. And, they, and your share of it might be 100 or whatever. And if you can get some of those, they're fantastic. But imagine if one woman snuck a little Tabasco into the batch. It wouldn't take much, would it? And that's what, that's what Jesus is talking about here. That's exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> it, it says that she mixed yeast into a large amount of flour. And, and this is the chemical process here is called leavening. Some versions just go ahead and say she leavened the dough. This yeast is like a living bacteria. And when it gets into the dough and mixes with the water and the temperature's right, the cultures of these bacteria spread. And they consume some of the sugars and they give off carbon dioxide. They, these little bacteria, they burp from time to time. They give off carbon dioxide and that's what makes the bubbles in your bread. That's what makes the bubbles in your beer, this process of fermentation. It's an interesting chemical process. I could uh, digress for hours on it. <laughs> if you make bread at home, you know this, right? You mix a little bit of flour, not 60 pounds, but you mix a couple of scoops of flour, and you have a little baker's yeast is what it's called. Believe it or not, that's been genetically modified to work faster. It's a GMO. <laughs> I like that. 
People that are opposed to genetically modified organs have no idea how many there already are. I'm sorry. That's an editorial, and we'll leave it alone. Baker's yeast has been genetically modified, so it can work through the dough faster in about two or three hours. So your dough will rise, and, 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 and you can make a loaf of bread at home pretty quickly. Real, before that was genetic, it sometimes took days. If you've ever made friendship bread, some of you know what friendship bread is. You got a little sample and you mix it with your stuff and you put it in a little bag. And then, and you know what this is, it is ironic to me. If you're OCD, cover your ears. We share bacteria with one another and call it friendship bread. <laughs> I, I, I can't get over that. I guess the more you know about that. But this is what's going on. And, and what it's meant to illustrate is influence. That's the main point, right? It is that a very small amount of this leavening agent can mix through a massive bat. The whole village could be influenced by this one woman. And that, that connects us with the power of gospel, doesn't it? My whole family, which now numbers close to 100, was influenced by my grandmother. She leavened that batch. She's still doing it. Right? Can you see that in your life? Can you see that in your family? Right? That's, awful. That's awesome. And sometimes that influence is unseen. <laughs> I, I really like the, the way the, the ESV, the English Standard Version, translates this. I think I've got it up here. It was like leaven, instead of yeast, they turned, used the word leaven, that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour. My gosh, this is a covert operation. She's sneaking into the village and hiding it. Is that, is that you? Is that interesting? Have you ever thought of yourself as a minister of the gospel disguised as a plumber? Or a minister of the gospel disguised as a teacher? Slowly sneaking your influence, working unseen below the surface, like what happened with the yeast. That's the vision of the kingdom I think Jesus is trying to connect with his followers. A small influence over a large group. Now, it's, it's important to point out that Jesus talked a lot about leaven, this idea of influence. And he talked a lot about it as a warning. Be careful. Be on your guard, he says at one point, against the leaven, the yeast of the Pharisees. See, this idea of influence can work both ways. It could work where a little, one little bad idea could sneak into a group of Christian followers and bam, turn them into awful stuff. Or it could work that one Christian could work into a small group of people in their neighborhood and the next thing you know, there's just a little bit more love. There's a little bit more concern for one another. There's a little bit more caring. There's a few more souls in heaven as a result of that. This, this idea of leaven that Jesus warned us of early in his ministry, he's now saying can work the other way. And that's what I want you to be. I want you to be on the attack when it comes to your leaven. Go into your business as a minister of the gospel disguised as an insurance agent and, and leaven it. Hmm? That's awesome. The kingdom of heaven will grow one-on-one. -on -one. You know, the disciples, Jesus wanted them to learn about this because they had a big shock waiting for them, didn't they? You know, in some ways, I'm glad we were spared having to see our leader crucified in front of us. They had to witness that. I guess as a way of evening it out, they, they got to see with their own eyes the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. I'm not sure, though, I could have handled the former in order to have been so blessed by the latter. We have been able to see, though, at our time, 2,000 years later, we've been able to see the truth of this parable, haven't we? That little mustard seed has turned into influence billions of Christians. But we've also seen that the opposition rises as well. And it comes in tides and it comes in waves. This isn't the worst time there's ever been but it might be pretty bad in some respects compared to anything we've ever seen in our lifetime. So we have to take heart in this parable. We have to take heart. We're still in that growth phase. We're still becoming that tree. And sometimes it's going to be one step forward and two steps back, isn't it? I mean, leavening the world one person at a time, that's going to go even slower than I go through the book of Luke. <laughs> but that's the only way. If there was another way, the Lord would be doing it, wouldn't it? That's the only way. <laughs> I tell you as we close today, the power of Christ is not dead. 
It never is. It wasn't at the tomb in Calvary, and it is not today. On the authority of God's word, this kingdom is coming, and we're growing towards it. We're in the middle of that process. It's got to happen in places where we can't see. And I tell you what, it always happens in ways better than the best we could ever imagine in the end. But we live through the struggle. So if you get discouraged about what's going on in the world, take heart, little flock. The kingdom is coming. We win. And as long as you possess the love of Christ, you can share it with someone. And there is leaven, and there is love. And we love others because he first loved us. It goes all the way back to that mustard seed. That's what 1 John 4, 9 says. We love because he first loved us. And we make a commitment today. We recommit ourselves. And we accept that love. And we will pass it on. Let's pray.